my career, I've been interested in abnormal fluid flows through tissues. For my PhD studies, um, I was looking at um, elevated interstitial fluid pressures and flows inside solid tumors. Um, and at my postdoc at the NIH, um, I was doing um, infusion flows into the brain. And so I was working with some of the surgical neurology group there um, at Oldfield and uh, Russell Unser. And then since 2003, I've been at the University of Florida. Um, and uh, I focus primarily on infusion models. So infusion into the spinal cord, infusion into the brain, and looking at you know the elevated and kind of abnormal fluid patterns that can can develop in tissues. Um, so I think uh, we're well poised to look at some of the interesting flow dynamics that can happen um, in syrinxes. Um, that said, so I come back from this kind of mac modeling background, um, and what we propose to do is a little bit more experimental. So it's taken us a little bit more time than we thought to get preliminary data, but so bear with me. Um, what I'll be presenting is, is quite preliminary, but I'll at least set up the problem that we're, we're proposing to tackle. Um, and, oh, perfect time. What we propose to do is look at um, mapping perivascular spaces in the spinal cord uh, towards improving um, some of the theories uh, that have been developed over the last years to, about um, spinal cord flow dynamics. Uh, I think basically what we're trying to do is provide some missing link, that's how I see it in any case, about flow outside the spinal cord in the intrathecal um, subarachnoid space and then flow uh, into the syrinx. So in terms of background, um, as you're uh, probably well aware, uh, perivascular spaces have been implicated as a fluid source for syringomyelia. Um, and just in terms of flow and flow dynamics, um, fluid flows are extremely sensitive to dimensions, um, like uh, to the fourth power. Um, so this idea that like the diameter or thickness of the perivascular spaces can greatly influence the, the pressures uh, that are required to drive flow, um, the timing, uh, when people talk about like pulse waves that go through um, the tissue space that might have drive flows, um, all the dynamics, like the, trans the time aspects, um, the pressure aspects are gonna be very dependent on, in the end, the environment and the geometry of these spaces. Uh, and these spaces can, uh, span multiple length scales from micron, right, um, all the way to millimeter. As you get from the larger vessels, um, as they branch, they get smaller and smaller, and so do the perivascular spaces. Um, what we're proposing to do, and other people have done these kind of distribution studies, uh, what we're proposing to do is just be a little bit more quantitative about it. So here are just some previous studies where they're looking at um, some tracer distributions. Uh, they're not showing up too well, but you're gonna trust me there. Um, but tracer distributions that have basically kind of like tracers that have accumulated in these kind of perivascular spaces. Uh, these are mainly for the brain. Um, but perivascular spaces exist throughout the CNS, um, wherever you have these penetrating blood vessels. And I got this picture from um, Lynn Belston's work, and she's, and uh, Dr. Steedley. They've done a, a number of models for uh, spinal cord um, and syrinx kind of uh, flow models. Um, but again, like I was saying, a lot of the, the previously developed like flow um, models have the, relied on somewhat idealized geometries and the existence of a perivascular space, but, and they've done some corresponding tracer studies, but like I said, we're just trying to really create like a 3D map um, that we can use and import into some sort of computational um, so I argue that we need to capture these, this spatial complexity um, over these multiple scales and do it in 3D. Uh, and basically use them as the foundation for really characterizing flow inside the tissue itself. How does that flow uh, traverse um, into the syrinx or out of the syrinx for that matter. Um, and that resistance tells you how much, you know, like fluid, it will always follow the, like a path of least resistance, right, um, this idea. And then that path of least resistance um, depends on these dimensions. Uh, so um, in terms of our methods, uh, we're basically trying to introduce tracers um, under different conditions that kind of mimic um, maybe a disease state. We're infusing into the intraventricular 
spaces, just basically some large protein dye. At this po point, it's going to be like Evans Blue Albumin. Um, we've done some of these. And we chose the ventricle just because we thought it'd be less disruptive to the spinal cord area itself. We didn't want to inject just right next to the spinal cord because that might interrupt any kind of na natural flow pattern. So we're injecting into the, the ventricular space, waiting a, a bit of time for the tracers to hopefully distribute throughout the perivascular spaces, be taken up, up into the <coughs> tissues. And because we're working with a larger protein, uh, we're hoping that the diffusion isn't so excessive that it goes into all the tissues, it's just taken up into the large channels, which are going to be the perivascular spaces. So it should hopefully just selectively define those spaces for us. And our preliminary data seems to show that. So we've injected, and then um, basically we're working with the fixed tissues and looking at them with confocal microscopy, and then um, trying to recreate these 3D geometries. Uh, obviously, we're not going to try to recreate all the perivascular spaces. We're just going to look at a small field of view like something like a, a millimeter by a millimeter by a millimeter is what we're going to try to reconstruct around one of the major arteries. So this idea that we can go from a major artery as it's entering tissue, um, hopefully to some point where we no longer have the resolution to really follow the perivascular spaces. Um, this is just, uh, that picture is just some preliminary data that we have generated um, looking at Evans Blue and the Evans Blue fluoresce is red. So what you're seeing there is the, the red along, um, I forget which, Artery, but it's in the bank, the anterior cerebral artery. Um, so you can just kind of see that with uh, the green fluorescent background. Uh, so this is another set of imaging data, which unfortunately can't see. Can, can you turn down the lights or something? I don't know. This is the most exciting of my slides at this point, <laughs> so I, I don't want it to go to waste. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, uh, it's too bad. Um, basically, <laughs> well, the red part is the perivascular space that we've re reconstructed, which you can kind of see it's just like a circle there. It's a little bit like a cylindrical tube, like a sleeve, which you would e expect the perivascular space to be, just a, like a sleeve around a, an artery. In this case, it's the anterior cerebral artery. Again, in the brain, um, we've just uh, so far just um, been testing our method um, in the rat brain, um, but we're in the process of doing the laminectomies to look at the corresponding spinal cord tissue. So that'll be exciting, but that said, like I said, this is our preliminary data. Um, unfortunately, you can't see the green, which is a little bit the surrounding tissue structures, but you like the blood vessel and the, the other tissues, but the green is, the red is the important part, the, the perivascular space. Um, oh, it's here it is, it's showing up a little better. Um, so this is, again, this is our, um, reconstruction just within one tissue slice around a major blood vessel. So this is the start of what's going to be a lot of work for my student Magdum of um, just using the chemical microscopy and then reconstructing slice by slice um, this geometry. Okay, so overall how does that fit into uh, like a kind of vision that we have going forward? So you can see in the middle there is the perivascular kind of mapping that we plan to do. Um, I know that Overall, in terms of fluid dynamic models, there's um, the subarachnoid space um, flow models. Um, this is on a large kind of macro scale where people use, you know, typically kind of um, Navier-Stokes types equations and you have to account for the pulsatility of the flow. Um, there's other kinds of models, spinal cord models, and uh, this is where I have a little bit more background. Just, oops, the spinal cord models. Uh, I've done a, a number of porous media flow, and just in that case, just treating the tissue. This is going towards uh, basically finite element models, but in this case, we're treating the tissue, we were solving for flow equations uh, for the spinal cord. At some point, I was doing um, like direct injections into the dorsal horn and looking at those flow patterns for it was uh, pseudomonas P and endotoxin. We were looking at um, injecting a, a chronic pain um, for, for chronic pain treatment, but in any case, uh, you can you can model the flow through the tissue as kind of this porous media. Uh, the idea is to like for syringa myelia introduce a syrinx into these into these kind of porous media spinal. Oof, keep doing that again. These <laughs> these models and uh, incorporate now, which is the trickier part. How do you account for this kind of multiple scales? Because before we just treat oh, the tissue itself is just kind of like a sponge like tissue. But really, if you look at it, you know there's going to be preferential transport prop pathways, like these perivascular, uh, these perivascular trans, uh, channels. Uh, and 
which is going to be more important. Like when you have like edema in the tissue, you have this abnormal accumulation of fluid. So is it more just going around the extracellular spaces, or is it always just um, just moving straight through the parabascular spaces? And I'm very much interested in that kind of um, these two different type of mechanisms of transport through the extracellular space of tissue. And in the end, through my at least for me, from the fluid dynamic point of view, I see it as a very complicated problem where you have multiple length scales going from, you know, like the micron size uh, scale of these paravascular spaces to the much larger serences and the, the, the intrathecal larger flow channels, right, just surrounding the spinal cord. But not just that, it's a complicated transient pattern as well because you have the timing of these pulse waves going through the CSF and then you have a dissipation of some of those effects as it goes through the tissues. And um, I, I find the, it a very intriguing problem, but I would say <laughs> one missing link that we're just looking, focusing at this one point before we incorporate into these kind of much more complicated um, uh, models is just can we rebuild that geometry, that paravascular geometry, and then we'll just start to do like flows along the outsides of those channels, just going towards these more realistic um, geometries. So that's overall, just kind of like the, the overall scope of what we're planning to do, uh, in, at least short term and then longer term. Um, I think that what we're trying to do is these kind of first steps towards 3D pathways. I know um, there's people looking at more simplified uh, ways to look at it just because it's more tractable. Um, it can give you more sy system type information, but we're looking at a very very focused uh, aspect at this point. And uh, like I was saying before, I think these geometries uh, are important and we're gonna import them into fluid dynamic models once we build them. And that this information can be used to help um, with various uh, formation theories. And uh, I thank you for your time and uh, open up for any questions you might have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? I don't have any questions, but just a comment. Like, thank God that people like you are interested in stuff like this. <coughs> that, that was fascinating, and I got about this part of it. But um, it, it's, really, it's really, it sounds like we're getting, every, every time we have this meeting, we're getting closer and closer and closer, and it definitely, it, this work shows that. So thank you. I don't mean to talk in a different language, but I know. I oh, know I, you know, I, just, <laughs> I don't mean that. I just mean, you know, it's just about. Just one comment. Your ability to understand our language is incredible. Mm -hmm. and, and I just like, I, and I think all of us compliment you immensely. Yeah. It's very well done. And very well presented. The, uh, so Ed Oldfield thought that uh, the fluid moving from the CSF space went through the perivascular spaces and somehow formed a syrinx, right? It, right, I mean, like the camera kind of yeah. model, right? Well, although, you know, I, I always challenged him on that. I thought, I can see how the fluid could move into a syrinx. I couldn't see how it would actually form the syrinx in the first place. And that I thought maybe the syrinx was formed because of uh, uh, maybe ap apoptosis and necrosis of some of the central neuroglia leaving a cavity that then secondarily filled with this fluid. But do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think you're right about just like, you know, if you just think about like uh, that kind of like transit, like pushing fluid in, um, most of the theories that people put, like the mechanical theories, will just say, all right, it just squeezes right back out, right? Um, when the, the pressure um, returns back to zero. Um, but I think tissue is a, is a living tissue, and it doesn't behave in this perfectly elastic way. Um, I think that's one of the, the things, right? So you have to account for like, tissue damage, and, and I think, for me, I think a thing that people haven't really looked at is this effect of edema and like necrosis and damage. And I think that um, as you get the thing, because you know, like, like brain swelling, right? Um, fluid accumulates in the tissue itself. And then it has, I think it'll have a tendency to redistribute as, uh, like you might have like apoptosis and things like that as, maybe even as cells are stretched due to like, you know, as it swells, you know, some of the, the cells could um, 
stretch even further, leading to a cycle of damage. I, I think it's a, a complex problem that mechanics has to be informed by the biology, otherwise it, it, you have to continually run your theories by experiments. Um, otherwise, I don't think it, it, it's easy as a modeler just to, to come up with beautiful theories, but then you know, it's, it's hard to uh, experimentally validate them. I'm rambling on there a bit just because I, I don't know the answer, but uh, uh, I think both you and Ed have some point, is what I would say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, we are.